I'm here in Madras, uh, in having a conversation with uh, people from IIT Madras. Uh, first, I've had a very lively discussion with students uh, in, in, the, in the campus in a, in a large auditorium where I've had many opportunities to speak. And now a, a, a smaller discussion with some faculty members. Uh, we're talking about, we're going to discuss a whole lot of things uh, around this uh, meritocracy attack, attack on meritocracy from Harvard University. Uh, an important anthropology professor of Indian origin uh, attacking IITs by name and coming up with a whole fabricated logic and data and history about what the problem is, essentially calling, calling them racist because they are casteist, this, he claims, and other people have claimed that caste is the same as race. So it's a multi-pronged attack. She just says casteist. Then these guys, some other books have said that caste equals race. And then there are people who are basically say, oh, this guy is at uh, Harvard Kennedy School, very prominent, uh, uh, radical kind of a thinking person, revolutionary, I should say, uh, who has uh, hyphenated uh, Dalits and African Americans, Dalits and Blacks, uh, into a whole theory. So anytime you are accused of being casteist, you're also by default racist. And this has got huge ramifications in the United States. And these ramifications are coming through the American multinationals, through their subsidiaries in India, and all the outsourcing, uh, you know, organizations in the Indian ecosystem in technology. So this should concern IT minister, IT, you know, the export ministers, engineering type of ministry people, HRD people, all of these, it should concern Ministry of External Affairs. Besides the government, it should concern Indian technocrats, the Indian industrialists, it should concern people in Silicon Valley. Of course, it will concern IIT students themselves. So this is an important, one of the most important discussions we've had during the book tour to launch this book. And I thank Professor Jalihal for leading this uh, conversation today. So over to you, Professor Jalihal. So uh, in uh, 2015, um, uh, Professor Ajanta Subramaniam, a Professor of Anthropology at Harvard University, wrote a very interesting paper uh, that appeared in um, the Comparative Studies in Society and uh, History uh, that's published by uh, Cambridge University Press. And the title of the paper is uh, Making Merit, the Indian Institutes of Technology uh, and the Social Life of Caste. And uh, she, of course, went on to build uh, her thesis further and uh, wrote this book uh, called The Caste of Merit, uh, Engineering Education in India, which sort of, you know, um, uh, builds up on what she wrote in this paper. So, so this is the early work on which uh, this paper, uh, the entire book is based. Um, you know, in the beginning, she says, um, uh, she, she talks about this um, new idea of caste as capital, right? How uh, in the modernizing India, um, Brahmins could effectively utilize caste as capital and uh, transform themselves into a casteless uh, uh, group, which I found is very interesting. So, what do you think? I mean, uh, is that uh, a correct category? Would that be because there are many um, divisions in India, right? Uh, I can tell you uh, there are divisions about uh, knowing English, not knowing English, knowing English with the correct accent, um, and becoming familiar with uh, uh, pop Western culture and just knowing English. So there are many categories, right? I mean, I, I can go on on this and all of you know, are aware of this. So, so she cites a French Marxist called Pierre Bordeaux, hmm. who came up with this theory of caste, as, of the theory of culture as capital. And she's adapting the culture as Indian caste. Yeah. And Pierre Bordeaux, if you want to be honest and apply Pierre Bordeaux correctly, she's not applying it correctly. He would say exactly that if the accent helps you get a job, <coughs> then that is a form of capital. If knowing English helps you get a job, that is a form of capital. And so you cannot homogenize all Brahmins and generalize everybody and say that all Brahmins are enjoying capital uh, in, in the cultural sense, because I'm sure there are Brahmins who don't know English, uh, right? And there are Brahmins who speak uh, English with a different accent. And then there are non-Brahmins who speak English in the American accent. So uh, to say that Brahmins have capital, cultural capital, it assumes that firstly the Brahmins are homogeneous. So, do you, what do you think of this idea that Brahmins are homogeneous? It's not true. I'll tell you how this the diversity has touched upon every aspect. 
the social diversity, linguistic diversity, and caste diversity. The Brahmin, let's say, from the state of Odisha, will have a different lifestyle, different uh, privilege, different social uh, ability, skill, compared to a Brahmin, let's say, from South, either from Karnataka or Tamil Nadu. So this homogenization doesn't make sense. Uh, privilege doesn't make sense, saying that the Brahmins are, say, upper caste, I think. At some point, they have generalized this as upper caste. They have the privilege, doesn't make sense. It is urban and uh, rural connotation. Uh, rural Brahmins may not have that privilege. Among the Brahmins, there are categories who are into education, who are into uh, farming. There are large number of Brahmins who actually are into farming. Uh, there are a large number of Brahmins who does this uh, regular low-paid priest job. I mean, to put them in the privileged basket, to me, is a crime. It doesn't make sense to me. Yes. So, anthropologically, does it make sense to have this caste uh, as a uh, capital category, right? I mean, uh, you know, considering that they are not a homogenized thing. Actually, Professor Jalihal, thank you very much. In fact, I have the article uh, on my computer screen. Yes. Um, actually, you are raising a very interesting methodological question, right? So, anthropology as a discipline, historically, has been obsessed with otherness. They will study people who, are, who look different, who eat differently, who speak differently, who dress differently. In the absence of difference, in the absence of what they imagine, vulnerability and marginality, the whole discipline will collapse. So in fact, this is what anthropologists themselves, at least the self-reflexive ones in the recent times, they have themselves have articulated. So when we talk about this particular essay and the category that she has created, cultural capital uh, borrowing, uh, incorrectly borrowing from uh, Bordeaux, because Bordeaux also speaks of symbolic violence which she himself, herself is indulging in. Because the, if the idea is to create otherness and then write about them, produce knowledge about them, then this also constitutes an epistemic violence. Because as Rajivji uh, a little while ago said that the native informant or the people who are written about, they have no scope to write back. They have no scope to, 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 to uh, integrate themselves in the knowledge that has been produced they have to always look for the ultimate oppressor, like, like the, an ultimate victim. There has to be an ultimate oppressor. In that, in that particular template, it's very textual actually. In that particular template, there is someone whose aggression cannot be doubted at all. So for example, in feminist discourse, it's basically the man, the male, or the, or the phallogocentrism or, or patriarchy. Similarly, for caste, they can be upper caste, lower caste. But at the end of it, everything becomes Brahminical. So, Brahminical patriarchy, right? So, that Brahminism remains the ultimate signifier for this particular knowledge. And she is trying too hard to create that particular category so that she can produce that knowledge around that. Um, oftentimes, when I was reading this article of hers, I felt that uh, she is sort of reproducing the Orientalist um, um, hierarchies. You know, that saw India as hierarchical, um, sanctioned by the Vedas and, uh, you know, uh, re, uh, uh, reiterated by the Gita and co codified by the Manu's laws. So, you know, she sort of puts Brahmins as the, at the top, at the hierarchy, possessing all the advantages. But that's the basis of the caste as capital. So, and, you know, you said um, Brahmins are not a homogenized society. Um, there are classes, economic classes among Brahmins and, you know, English education has created even further divisions. So how, how do you see this, this entire, you know, caste as capital in the anti-orientalist discourse? I mean, if I'm going to say that, you know, anti-orientalist uh, uh, sort of literature that has come about in the last 30, 40 years. C wants to establish a particular theory and this theory has been articulated by someone else from 60 years ago, 1970s, 80s, in the book called Distinction, and her objective is to find that particular category which will establish uh, her credential as a, as a proper anthropologist. Naturally, in that scheme of things, the evolving dimension of knowledge will not mean much because she believes in template thinking. 
So then she talks about the history of uh, founding of IITs, how um, the um, Indian, um, uh, when India became independent, how they articulated modernizing India and they gave disproportionately high amounts of money uh, to IITs. So I was just looking at the numbers, right? Um, uh, um, uh, Harvard University has an endowment, uh, I, you know, I, I found from Wikipedia, of US dollar 50 billion. That is uh, 4 lakh crore Indian rupees. That is one Harvard University's endowment. And the total Ministry of Education budget of India is less than 75,000 crore rupees. That is, we, you know, the total Indian education budget that includes budget of IITs and everything put together is, you know, one eighth, yes. one eighth of Harvard University's endowment. And yet, uh, sitting in Harvard, she says, um, you know, uh, IITs are privileged because they have, they have access to unlimited amount of funds. So, uh, you know, so. Uh, Very strange. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, what I find strange is that she has not invited a peer review. And the, the Cambridge University Press, where the paper was published, and Harvard University Press, where the book was published, I, I would say shame on them because they did not invite peer reviews by people who are qualified, who are independent thinkers. So maybe if she made this kind of a claim, every one of those claims, there are people who would make counterclaims. Those counterclaims should be at least considered. Whether they are right or wrong is another matter, but at least they should be on the table. So there was no peer review by people in the HRD ministry because she's uh, talking about their history. I don't think there was a peer review by people in IIT Madras, uh, people like yourselves. So she came and uh, as, uh, as you said, she had template thinking. Template, she had a template and she wants to prove that template is correct and she's looking for picking and choosing data that fits and she doesn't have to uh, cite her sources and she doesn't have to give any counter arguments because the power of Harvard is such that whatever they choose, they will put it out there. There is no independent uh, due, due diligence on it and so it becomes fact, it becomes established fact. This is what has happened because I, the arguments are so shallow. I think she has just taken a sample of micro size and try to create a differentiation within it. And that's where the okay. problem is. I think uh, just after independence, if India would have thought that they would have made all the educational institutes of equal stature and distribute the money equally, probably they could not have built some decent institutes. I think that was the need of the hour to emphasize few set of institutes. Uh, Pandit Nehru had uh, this vision. And those institute, if excel, they will contribute back to the society and that has worked. And it has worked and IITs, since they have performed better, they have produced better, uh, the autonomy is being granted. And they have not uh, taken the autonomy for granted. I mean, IITs have paid attention to make sure that the excellence is maintained. So, you know, the best proof is that the IITs are producing output, which is taking over Silicon Valley. More, there are more IIT produced CEOs and top level people than Harvard in their own country. So obviously the strategy has worked. Harvard is 350 years old. This is much younger from a poorer country and able to, in spite of colonization and all the biases against brown people and all that, has been able to do well. So either it is jealousy that, you know, they are jealous that India, a poor country, has been able to put this together and come on the world stage and produce world class people beating the Harvard. So this is to me how I would look at it. You know, she makes a very, I mean, in, in the beginning talking about IIT history, she says, uh, IITs feel like one is entering a world apart from the vicissitudes of Indian social and political life. Um, they are typically set on large pristine campuses funded by central government uh, at levels far above their competitors. Uh, you know, and in that context, I said that, uh, you know, the, the funding is nothing. And even American universities look very different from American towns. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you have seen American universities. Prin so, Princeton so. University, I, I live in Princeton, is like a huge township and so luxurious and so pristine and so many billions of dollars worth of land itself. So I don't think they are in a position to make this. So, so I mean, you know, she picks out some campuses. I'm sure all Delhi University colleges, even St. Stephen's College, I'm sure looks very different compared yeah. to, you know, uh, Silampuri's uh, slums in Delhi. So, I mean, you know, uh, academic institutions in India, all Serenan are privileged. I mean, I think we, we, we all accept that. 
but so are the academic institutions all over the world. Tell me and one single country uh -huh. where a set of academic institutes are not very good compared to the rest of them. No, no, yeah, you're I mean, right. you look at Oxford, Oxford, yeah. all of these places. Yeah. See, also has to factor in the fact that that they were built with these generous grants. It was not government of India funding at that time. They were actually built with those grants which came from different countries. And IIT Kanpur in particular, I mean, they received such a generous fund that which was twice the size of anything that had been received so far. All the three IITs before that put together. So that was the kind of grant we are talking about. So when they came into existence, they didn't come into existence with uh, Indian uh, money for that matter. Long before uh, Nehru, we had Balgangadhar Tilak, who yeah. was actually talking about um, MIT type institutions in India. And he would be spending money, he will be collecting money, sending students to MIT to go there, study and learn a few tricks, learn the skill and come back and, and set up industry in India. And when actually the the uh, the Sarkar Commission, uh, which was actually established, it was actually it was still the colonial period. India had not yet become independent. And the report when the report was submitted, the war war is over. And then in India has become independent, and it was not even a full report. It was only an interim report on which IITs uh, were uh, established. So uh, and IIT the name didn't exist until 1961. I mean, IIT Khadakpur was called Eastern Higher Technical Institute. It is only in 1961 that we know that there is something called this Act of Parliament. We have IITs, IITs Act and all that. So when she says that it was with all the generous funding and all that, we ignore that particular dimension that it was actually built with uh, foreign assistance. No, I, I, I would like to add this. Yes, I mean, this idea of having few set of excellent institutes was conceived by many pre-independence, not necessarily post-independence. But then what is wrong with it? See, there was a need of to have a good number of world-class teachers to have them in other smaller institutes. And you need laboratories. You, you need have laboratories. Or you everywhere. You, you know? have to have some laboratories. I mean, one thing that we always forget that imagine the number of teachers that IITs have produced right. in addition to our B.Tech undergrads. Most of the NITs and other institutes have teachers who have done their PhDs from IITs. I mean, that also you need. I mean, how can you start a plethora of institutes without giving them proper support, be it academic, uh, infrastructure, or manpower? I mean, when, when a social scientist or an anthropologist is actually writing about IITs and producing knowledge about IITs, it's definitely asymmetrical because it, 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 it uses social science vocabulary and usually engineers have no access to that vocabulary. So they cannot really write back in the, in, the, in the same way that an anthropologist or a cultural critic or a historian can build the arguments, right? And they talk to each other. Uh, actually, it, they they talk to each other in their own absolutely. jargon. Yeah. Like, like you could have a techie person, a physicist talking absolutely. to other absolutely. physicists, absolutely. and the absolutely. social scientist would not know what the heck is going yeah, yeah. And that vocabulary survives on the politics of difference. Knowledge in social science today is the knowledge of producing difference. Brahmins have used their caste privileges to modernize quickly and become casteless, right? And then she says, if somebody says caste is not of importance, uh, then he is definitely is a Brahmin. So, uh, so the, the caste blindness, she says, is, is an outcome of privileges. I mean, a, a lower caste person cannot say that, right? Uh, which I find very problematic simply because, uh, you know, for the things that we talked about, uh, that is, there are people, poor people among Brahmins and poor people among everywhere else, they are probably, you know, attached to, to so to say that uh, once you have the caste capital, you can modernize and, and become caste blind, right? So would that be appropriate to say that, you know, modernization process makes you caste blind and uh, not having modernized uh, makes you more cost conscious. I mean, you will find communities which are much more cosmopolitan. Hardly anyone knows what is the cost of the other person. Mm. So I think it is time to look at the things in a different aspect. I mean, people who have greater access and people who have lesser access. Rather than saying that they are a caste group of having certain privilege and they are another caste group of having lesser privilege. I think this is wrong. So you, it is a high time to see that people have, some of them will have greater access, I mean, right? 
and some of them will have lesser access. And lesser access community can be from any group. I mean, uh, they can be Brahmin, they can be non-Brahmin, they can be sort of uh, anything that you think of. Similarly, greater access to community. I mean, you go and look at any residential area in Bangalore or Mumbai or Delhi or Chennai. I mean, the residential areas have their own uh, characters. And you know, like, uh, as you said, today nobody knows the cost of somebody that they'll be doing the business with. You go online and you order some home delivery food. The guy who brings you whatever, you don't know whether he's a caste person, this exactly. one, that one, whether you're accepting food based on caste. So that old stigma is not there. It's not even practical. You mm -hmm. go to a restaurant, whoever is serving you food, you don't care and ask him what is your caste before you accept his food. So this, these old ideas that she's carrying as baggage, mm -hmm. which makes good, uh, good uh, rhetoric in Harvard because they're guilty white people. Uh, and and it, it, they make a good audience. She can show that uh, she comes from this culture and she's exposing and they'll reward her. And they're, they're the blacks, she'll tell them that, look, these people, lower caste people, are uh, race, they are racially prejudiced against them like blacks in America. All this is that good storytelling in America, but it is not factual. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. totally, it is biased and it is completely, it's sloppy scholarship. I mean, I'm afraid that uh, this uh, paper that I went through is reasonably unscientific. Um, uh, and uh, she, she also talks about how uh, the student Karthik, uh, who graduated in 1995, felt good to be at IIT Madras. Right? So, is it possible to build an entire theory or <laughs> Based on one or two stories, there's one Karthik, there is one Madras. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where I said that it sounds a little unscientific. I mean, you, you want me to write a story, I can create such characters on yeah. my own and write stories. Yeah. But coming yeah. back to this case, um, every IIT, everyone should know that IITs attract students from all over India. Uh, the C has not understood the demography of IIT matters. Uh, be it faculties, be it the research scholars, be it the undergraduate students. So, I mean, she's actually picking out the Tamil Brahmins. Yeah. I mean, a subcategory from a smaller category out of a bigger domain, what you call general class. I mean, uh, you can actually extrapolate the idea and you can say that hardly 1%. 1%, I mean, I don't have the exact number like all of you have. And nobody does that cast, uh, counting uh, inside IITs. I mean, nobody knows even that the student you are teaching, uh, whether they belong to this caste or that caste, this community or that community. But roughly considering, I mean, how many? 1%, 2%? It so, cannot go beyond that, I'm telling you. So you can... basically, I, I would put it this way, that we just don't have any convincing way of knowing what exactly is the percentage of X cast or Y so cast? So she doesn't have any statistics. Absolutely. No start. You cannot take pick one character, two character. I mean, also we don't know whether those characters are fictitious or real. And build a story uh, out of it uh, on a institute of national importance. So, so English as a English as a marker uh, of uh, English as a cultural asset, cultural capital is far more important absolutely. and difficult to acquire and requires a lot of uh, uh, effort and all that, then buying some thread as a, uh, any symbolic thing. Yeah, absolutely. Any symbolic thing. Yes. And she's focused on symbolism as a form of capital, which is very easy to acquire. Anybody can go buy it, uh, rather than the, 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 the anglicization and the Americanization and the modernization of people, which is a far more important form of cultural capital. That's I, the point you're making. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can give you my own example. I, I entered IIT. I knew English, but I didn't know the the, the pop Western culture, which was the hallmark of the people who sort of, you know, dominated, right? right? So, so I know, I know what it means, right? I know the, you, you, you should talk, you should show your familiarity with, you know, certain books, the idiom, certain movies, yeah. okay, then you are accepted. Yes. If you don't have the familiarity, you are excluded. Right. So, all this basic talk of inclusion and exclusion is not caste based, right. at least in the IITs. So unless, unless you consider Americanization as a caste. Correct, correct. Yeah, yes. Sure. <laughs> One more thing I would like to add. How you know who is from who is from which caste? That's another point. Yeah, yeah, because see, we all look the same. You look the same. It's not, and it is not the same thing as race in America because they, it's very clear it's who is black skin. and who is white. So this business of we should come and discuss that also. This business of moving this whole thing, casteism as a form of racism, 
is a it takes us to another level later later we can talk about that see there is some point i mean maybe we will talk later i just want to add one line uh, the surname no longer holds what, which caste one belong to i mean you cannot guess people from odisha if they have certain surname are they belong to this caste or that caste i mean i think this is a complete misnomer that has been used by many her argument is simple, Professor Jandihar. Basically, that may, there is nothing called merit. Yeah. Merit is a caste privilege, mm -hmm. number one. Number two is that it is culturally conditioned and cultivated. And number three is that IITs perpetuate that. And it is not just a space of engineering and innovation. It is a, it is a space of definitional marginality and asymmetry, right? And hence, it is not a democratic space. That is what basically the argument of the paper is, as simple as that, right? And then she maps it against the, um, up to the idea of India as being an incomplete democracy, right? Sure. And the other thing, she uh, when she said that during 80s or 90s, a good number of engineering colleges came up because that's what the job market required. Uh, if we think Indian engineering education system, on the top prior we have IITs, then we have a good number of NITs, and NITs 50%, I believe. Uh, students come from the local state, that particular state. Then we have state government colleges. And the South, uh, in South at that time, the IT sector and software sector boomed. And people found that uh, these engineering colleges can provide uh, yeah. skilled people to these sectors. And that's how the engineering college started. And it's a good thing. And of course, it's market driven. Market driven. It's driven by the needs of the industry, the industry and where the jobs are. If at all, then I can even propose that IITs as institutions which provides a certain type of skill set is not something that you usually see in liberal universities, right? So now, contrary to what she claims, it is now the liberal arts universities which are money spinning spaces. Let me give the example of Asoka, let me give the example of Kriya, which demands a, a, around 9 lakh rupees for a, a liberal arts program. Right? So what type of elitist spaces are those? This is a very important point. Yeah. The liberal arts which is mirroring Harvard, the Harvard's branch office in India, which is things like Kriya in the south, Ashoka in the north, uh, you know, uh, Godrej Cultural Labs, Azim Premji, all these private kind of a things which are into liberal arts, uh, Harvard imported liberal arts. They are the ones charging tens of lakhs in, style, in uh, admission, uh, tuition fees for the elites to come in, whereas IITs are hardly, uh, I don't know what the fees is, but very low. Uh, well, it's not low now, it is 1 lakh uh, per but, semester. Right? But 1 yeah. lakh compared to yeah, 10 yeah, lakhs. Yeah. So uh, 10 to 1 yeah. overpriced in liberal yeah. arts where you don't even get a job of that kind. But So if you want to talk about elitism, then you have to talk about the liberal arts of India yeah. and, see, and see that uh, they, are, they are educating the kids of the elites in India. And then, send, uh, you know, in the mirror of what Harvard wants them to be. That's a different, that's what she, as an anthropology, should be studying. I mean, she is actually offending something called merit. Merit is raw intelligence plus individual effort. You have to respect those two things, right? So if somebody is putting enough effort and has the raw intelligence, getting into a institute like IIT, we should appreciate that. Mm. And put that individual effort to a, subscribing that to a particular caste or privilege is a crime. I, I don't accept it. So basically you are trying to say that, that in, it is individual industry which actually must sure. replace this idea but of community yeah. privilege and all that. You have to respect yeah. the individuality sure. I and mean, individual effort. Yeah, so, so you are in fact arguing for a meritocracy. Yeah. And 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 she completely, you know, uh, against. Uh, I mean, she thinks arguments of meritocracy in India simply means, you know, uh, uh, continuing with brahminical privileges. Then she talks about one professor in IIT Madras. She doesn't name the professor. Mm. Uh, he says, um, you know, um, those who come through that uh, OBC plus, they are haunted for their life because they are in without uh, uh, the necessary background, right? He says, it haunts them that uh, they have gotten admission through their quota. I mean, people hold opinions. So uh, uh, she sort of makes it into a, a big thing that, you know, some person spoke against the 50% reservation, which is now there in IIT. Uh, and again, this is not a a thing that anybody has measured, right? Yeah. Ah. 
I mean, you know, I mean, we have not done any scientific study in IIT to say that those who have come through reservation have done necessarily done badly. Those who have come through the other uh, the the um, OCL, you said the uh, uh, CRM, common rank. Yeah, common rank list have necessarily done better, right? Because uh, uh, I have had examples where those who have come through the common admission have gone into depression, you know, uh, uh, have dropped out. And those who have come through OBC category have done very well, right? And for this professor to say that uh, it haunts them for life is, I think it's an individual opinion. I mean, so can that privilege, you know, and can that be put in, in an academic paper uh, and, and argue uh, uh, around that, that uh, people are against OBC uh, quota? Professor Ali Hal, we have uh, taught many batches. Yeah. We are taking many classes. Yeah. When we get into a classroom, yeah. do you see students sit based on their caste preference? No, they don't, right? Yeah. Do you see students ask each other what is your caste? Do you see faculty asking the students what is your caste? Don't you see that students intermingle? Nobody knows about others' caste. Let me put it uh, no, no. very. Uh, but I think, point I, think uh, I agree with her in a very limited sense that we need to conduct a study, right? We, we don't have a data today whether the people who come through quota, it sort of haunts them for their entire life. I, I mean, that's a statement she made. No, but, but how, how it will haunt uh, to them uh, entire life if somebody else doesn't know what is his or her quota is? Yeah. I, I mean, think I, I we are, you, we are this. This is, this is basically what you're saying is she doesn't have any data. She doesn't have any logic yeah. or basis. She yeah. just made up some conclusions. Yeah. And some study should be done, and there's a plausibility argument which is actually saying that she's probably wrong. Yeah. No, I, I think by making such statement, we are disrespecting students. We are disrespecting students who we are trying to sort of make it look as if they don't deserve merit. They said that on merit, these guys are not able to compete. She's actually talking down at some people. I totally agree with you, um, Rajiv ji. <clears throat> so this is something they are making their best effort to come out of that trap. However, our knowledge producers here in this case, the present author, they want them stay confined to that particular exactly. trap. They okay. want the victim because then they can become, have a job. Perpetual the, supply. They, 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 are, they have the job of uh, championing the victim. Absolutely. So they want to create Absolutely. victims if they don't exist. If they exist, they want to make it worse and contain them. Because otherwise, if, if the so-called victims say we are empowered, we are in a free flowing merit-based competition, then you know she's out of work. Professor Jalihal, I would actually like to expand this. So thank you for bringing this dimension. It's very interesting because one here, one who goes quote unquote experiences marginality wants to come out. The other one who is the, in the business of rescuing that doesn't want him to come out because then he will be or she will be out of job. That brings me to the difference of politics of representation and the politics of experience or the politics of presence. So suppose I belong to X category. I am trying my best to come out of it. I am doing my best, I study, I work hard so that actually my future life will be better. Okay, so this is politics of presence. I want to assert myself or maybe I don't want to do something. I want to do politics or I want to assert my identity. It's up to me. But more often than not in case of IIT students, we are actually talking about a scenario where the student wants to come out of that. The other one is politics of representation, the author here. So the author doesn't want the student to do that. I mean, I have been a faculty advisor for many batch of students for the last 10 years. I have never seen one evidence where a student come and tell me so the job of the faculty advisor to understand students' personal issues related to academics, not family and social. So, so student has never, I have not seen any single student who has come to me saying that uh, since I am from OVC, I am feeling isolated, secluded, or some people are looking down on me. Nothing of that sort. These, are, these are debates from within Absolutely. our system. You don't need a Harvard, you don't need... It's some, debate within. Yeah, you, you don't need uh, US Congress passing some laws of racism. You don't need uh, legal action against Cisco. You don't need any of that. These are evolution of thought based on Indian people from all communities being able to debate openly. It's Harvard which is closing the debate by yeah. having cancel culture. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, this is very interesting. Then she switches now, she goes to Silicon Valley, same 2005, post-2005. Uh, um, uh, you know, she calls the, that as a defense of upper caste meritocracy against low caste quota has been widespread. I mean, I'm, I'm quoting from her paper, not just in India, but also in the diaspora 
in the, in the United States, the IITN's merit is rarely, if ever, expressed in terms of caste. Uh, it surfaces, however, in the face of perceived threats uh, to their institutional brand posed by the entry of low castes. Uh, as the extension of OBC quota to the IITs was being debated in the Indian Parliament, alumni in Silicon Valley, organized under the banner of Indians for Equality, started online petitions, staged public protests and, and solidarity uh, campaigns and wrote letters to the Indian presidents against reservations. At one such public protest held at Sunnyvale, California, a stone's throw from the head offices of Google, Yahoo, Cisco and Intel, an IIT alumnus working as a Silicon Valley engineer commented to an Indian reporter, let Arjun Singh, I mean, who was the Minister of Education at that time, do whatever he wants to any educational institution in India, but tell him to leave IITs alone. Okay. So, and then she of course builds a story on that, right, and, and how um, they, you know, they are trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, retain their protect privileges, the privileges, protect the caste privileges, and then she goes on to make a prediction, right, a very dire prediction. She says, uh, the impact of 2005 reservations on postgraduate trajectories remains to be seen, she says. My prediction is, I mean, she, she is now Bhavishyamani. My prediction is that IITN network of institutions, uh, kinship will inc increasingly fracture and begin to, uh, to be tracked along general category and reservation category. So she, she now makes a prediction that the one group of IITNs, maybe in the US, will in the future be fractured. Second thing, when someone says that, someone apparently from Silicon Valley said that keep IIT out of this. I think that basically we should read that keep IIT out of political interference. I think that should the, that's the message that that gentleman was trying to sell. Instead of saying that you do this caste privilege, that caste privilege, that's wrong. Generally in India, people always try to say academicians or technocrats, they try to say that keep the education system out of politics. Uh, this fracture is being invented in Cisco itself where they are now accusing some bosses of discriminating some people based on, the, based on the caste. So whether the fracture has happened naturally or not, it is at least being invented. But that it has nothing to do with manufactured. But that has nothing to do with IIT. They are saying that. I mean, oh, the famous case that's going on against Cisco, right, is, is, is basically that. No, but again, I will put it. Yeah. How in a company, once you are one uh, uh, you know, person who is sitting on the decision making group, will know whose caste is what. Basically, she says that uh, IITNs have been producing people because of their caste background, uh, people who don't want to work with hands. I mean, it's, I, I think that's just she, a, in fact, says that's why they became good at computer science computer. because they don't have to work with, huh. get their hands dirty. Yeah. And so there is a whole emphasis on computer science because the Brahmins don't want to get their hands dirty. Yeah. So, so this is, uh, whereas I would think it's, it's a market opportunity related to. Uh, if yeah. there were a market opportunity for one kind of engineering, then more people would go, more to, people go to that. Uh, exactly, yes. Unfortunately, at that time, we didn't have uh, a good market for manufacturing jobs. I mean, the software booming was happening. So everybody thought that I'll get a job. So people will slowly drift in that direction. To say that uh, you are a upper caste guy, you don't want to dirty your hand. And I'm sure she has no idea what kind of lab classes we do in IIT. All the practical lab classes, you have to dirty your hand. This is an important point, actually. Maybe she, she just doesn't have the insider's knowledge. Actually, she doesn't even know the idea of a lab and the kind of things our students are actually exposed to, starting from carpentry yeah. to all kinds of things. See, three to four afternoons a week, student goes to lab. Mm. Every student. Every student. I mean, all engineering, and you all science. Work with your hands. Yeah, you have to work with your hand. I mean, what else? Including carpentry. Yeah, including carpentry. She makes a point that um, um, merit uh, versus democracy, the point that you alluded to before. So um, they are conflicting. Merit versus democracy. Democracy in India. She, she basically makes an argument that if you go for merit, then you can't be democratic, at least in the Indian context. So what that will do is it will yeah. make India less competitive, because if you if you if you uh, 
get rid of meritocracy, yeah. then basically, you know, whether you get rid of meritocracy in basketball or in yeah. cricket or whatever, uh, then you mediocre people who don't have merit will be on par with those who have merit. And so the team will become less competitive. This is true in any competitive area, whether it is sports, whether it is technology, whether anything, military. So, uh, anti-meritocracy means that you don't have competitiveness. And if you don't have competitiveness, you lose out in the global market. Uh, and, and so, we will become slaves, we will become poor. It's not like uh, Dalits will rise, it, everybody will be poor. So, to compete on the world market, we have to compete based on the rules of the market. The rules of the market are competitive. And so, if you are, she probably doesn't know anything about team sports. She probably doesn't know anything about military, which is competitive area. You have to get the best soldiers. Uh, so, industry, every industry has to do that. Not only IIT, every industry, every uh, person in the neighborhood who's got some business, whether he's, he may be a poor guy, but he's selling something, he has to be competitive. The fruit fellow has to be competitive. Sure. The fruit fellow has to be on merit that his fruit should not be spoiled yeah. and he has to get the right inventory, do the right pricing. That fellow is running a merit-based system. All the entrepreneurs in India of all classes, all castes, whether it's a taxi driver, he's on merit. So whatever profession may be, uh, to compete and succeed, you have to be a merit-based person. And so, to fight against the principle of merit as anti-democracy uh, is, a, is a terrible uh, kind of uh, blow, uh, attack on uh, the survival of a culture, if, of a civilization in the modern world. So, so, you know, I would say survive, prosperity requires competitiveness in the world, modern world. And competitiveness requires cultivating meritocracy. And this is how you have to survive in the world. I mean, she, she has no alternative proposal if you dismantle meritocracy. How do you remain competitive? And if you are not competitive, how do you become prosperous? I will tell you, I, will tell you, uh, I had this uh, debate uh, with some uh, these progressive type people. Uh, they also have uh, put quotas on Asians in getting into uh, STEM education sure. because Asians do very well in math and so on saying that this uh, meritocracy is a privilege that uh, they have and it is against the blacks in America. You are against, uh, so Harvard, for example, limited uh, South Asian, how many, how many Asians, including Chinese and all, can get in based on uh, competition. There's a Supreme Court case going on right now in the US on whether they should be allowed to do this kind of a thing. So people told me that, uh, you know, your, your advantage uh, in your math and all, there's unfair advantage and therefore you should not be allowed to benefit from it. So I gave the argument, I said blacks being taller are better in sports than Asians. You have over-representation in basketball and in football and, and therefore you are oppressing Asians. And we are the oppressed and you are the oppressor. And so we need to have quota. We should put a, a certain number of Asians minimum in every sports team. And the US Olympic team should have more Asians and less blacks. So if you, if you think Asians are better in math, that's a matter of... Uh, uh, pre caste prejudice and racism and all that, then you are better in sports and that's a matter of caste pre uh, privilege you guys have or race, race privilege you guys have. There is no answer to that because you see these rules, they are made up these rules but and the and the Indians who are into all this game trying to claim that caste is race, they are silent, they don't know what to say because they have never been confronted with plain logic. Yeah, the table is turned on them. The table is turned on them. I think uh, yeah, this brings, uh, I mean, the same thing we can apply uh, when people take admission in IIT. If you make a state-wise statistics, few states have over-representation over in IITs. It's just not uh, only caste. I mean, few states have over-representation because some other states, some other traditions much more prevalent. I mean, some states are very good at uh, industry and entrepreneurial stuff. Very good some other states, they prefer academic life. So, I mean, should be another category of analysis. Yeah, in terms yeah of analysis. sure, sure. Because right. in India, the development and, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic progress has been very uneven. Sure. Some regions have done very well. Some regions have not done well. So, uh, region has to be a category. Just like English is a category. Yeah. Region also has to be maybe, a category. Maybe a Punjab farmer has an advantage in farming. Yeah. Because he comes from a certain tradition, he learnt it and he has that advantage. Yeah. And somebody else in Tamil Nadu has an advantage in, as a fisherman. Uh, and the Punjabi doesn't know how to... You yeah. go for fishing. So, you could also come up with all kind of theories of oppression based on what is actually a natural phenomenon. And, and so, yeah. we, our position is we believe in equal opportunity. And, and then the outcome comes based on the effort. Maybe she is a victim of her own vocabulary. 
I mean, I mean, she herself has been manipulated. She just knows no better. She has to somehow see, as you know, I mean, many of these so-called research grants, they expect you to write in certain ways to, to give you results, certain types of results. So maybe she is a victim of that particular vicious circle that, that without her being so aware Harvard, of it. Harvard uh, rat race. So uh, she's into that and she's playing the game. And she says, this is what they like, a brown skin person yeah. will talk against yes. all the, her tradition. So is she a victim? At, at times I wonder, is she a victim or she is a perpetrator? Yeah, because she, she ends the essay with uh, by saying, it is difficult to see how meritocracy could be made commensurate with the ideals of Republican democracy. So, I mean, it's uh, counterposing democracy versus meritocracy and she's saying one doesn't promote the other, uh, at least in the, in the Indian context. I don't know whether she, she would say the same thing for Singapore or US, where US is, is you know, meritocratic. meritocratic. Singapore definitely, it claims that we are a meritocratic state. I mean, they openly say that. Right? If you, if you ask, if you write, if you have prejudice and you write a research paper, it's not a proper research paper. And then furthermore, if you don't cite empirical evidence, okay, and it's opinions of various people. And then furthermore, you don't subject it to due diligence and peer review of people with opposing yeah. views. If you have all three of these, prejudice to start with, no imperial evi empirical evidence and no peer review, then that is not fit for Harvard University Press or any Harvard professor or Cambridge Press or any of that. And, and I am surprised that they have published it. Well, they published that paper in Cambridge and this book is from Harvard University Press. This is her book, Harvard University Press. Uh, and so uh, this is a sham. This is a really shameful thing that uh, uh, this, this such a thing can happen. Um, yeah, this, the cast of merit published by Harvard University Press. Building on um, uh, Ajanta Subramaniam's paper, um, this framework is now widespread um, in Tamil Nadu, in India and wherever Indians go and this framework is used um, to distinguish, to, to create categories, to create differences, to create fault lines uh, uh, among Indians, which to us, to some extent, didn't exist, at least among the professional class. Um, I'll give you uh, two examples uh, of which IIT Madras is a victim. Uh, all of you are aware of it. Uh, the first one happened in 19, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2019, uh, very unfortunate incident. Uh, one young student uh, committed suicide. She had just come into IIT first year, first semester. In, within two or three months, she committed suicide. Um, and um, it was painted as if um, the uh, Brahmin teachers of IIT Madras uh, persecuted her and uh, she had no, no other way left. And of course, the teachers were trauma traumatized. Uh, they were subjected to a lot of uh, media uh, speculation, uh, media view. Um, that's one, of course, we can talk more about that. A uh, second one happened, um, uh, uh, you know, one year ago and uh, finally it, it ended uh, in early part of this year where uh, one faculty member uh, accused the entire IIT administration of um, uh, you know, having primary privileges and oppressing uh, OBC. I mean, nobody knew that the, the person was OBC. So this thing is now spreading and um, unfortunately IIT Madras had no way of reacting to this. I mean, they had no organized way, they had no understanding of uh, of the of what they are facing no counter opinion no i mean they I mean, more than uh, uh, the only thing they could say is we'll conduct an internal investigation mm -hmm. right uh, 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 so but that is lack of purva paksha of uh, this kind of a theory. so they have no understanding of where this is coming from so a template had been created by these kind of scholars and there are many others i'm also tracking in my in my book snakes in the ganga which explains where this is coming from and this is one small, this is one very big but important but once only one subset of a bigger problem that's going on in America, this whole anti-meritocracy and anti-IIT movement. So what has happened is that a certain set of assumptions have been made, a template thinking and this is being applied to interpret somebody's suicide, this is being applied to, it's sort of like it's assumed by default that this is, this is what, what the problems are. And so, whenever some example comes up, it has to be analyzed in this way. This is what ha happening, I guess, and this is unfair. But the, I would say that uh, IITians are all over the world. IIT Madras people are all over the world. I know some of them personally, they're brilliant people. And so, their meritocracy is going to be challenged. 
and also uh, being accused of Brahmanical, you know, privilege and all that. And now it is going into, uh, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley lawsuits are being filed uh, against companies where there is a person, uh, Indian working, their caste has to be disclosed, they have to do surveys on caste and they have to go through workshops of uh, caste sensitivity because caste is considered equivalent to American racism. That's a very, very serious matter that is happening. Uh, so, how, so this is not only affecting IIT Madras people, but IITNs in general, all IITNs. And then beyond IITNs, all engineering people, all tech people now, uh, the idea being that, okay, this Indian techno technocrats are uh, bringing caste. There are articles being written that Indians, you think they're all helping us coming here doing this work, but do you know that they are polluting our country, bringing racism into our country because they're all casteist people. So, and there are also discussions that maybe this H-1B visa should have caste quotas because, uh, you know, this meritocracy on which you think is uh, hiding caste privilege inside you. So, this, and then the, there are uh, HR departments in some of these very big Microsoft and Facebook and, you know, Google and all these kind of companies are looking at the proposals that these activists are bringing in that you should conduct a caste census and you should um, modify your hiring practices. And then you should conduct a similar caste census in your Indian subsidiaries and in the outsourcing uh, organizations in India that may be independent, but you are hiring those people and they're doing uh, work for you and you should see if there is any racism going on. Uh, because uh, if you are racist in your headquarters, that's very bad. But if you are pro pro promoting racism in India and, and bringing products from racist organizations in India, that's very bad. So, American laws are being challenged to change in this way. Harvard has enacted official policy that casteism is racism. Harvard has enacted this. And so have some districts in California uh, where all these Silicon Valley places, uh, companies are based. The problem has expanded to quite a large extent and the reason I wanted to engage all of you which I thank you for is I want to bring to you that there, is a, there are dimensions beyond just local uh, and your students uh, sitting in class uh, they are going to face this when they go out there will be stigma and they will be put on the defensive. So, a person will be less ambitious, maybe less courageous because he will say okay if I do too well, if I stick my neck out this is how they will hit me. So, they have got a they've got a way to hit me and I better be careful. So, this means that the person is not going to be as, uh, you know, passionate and uh, aggressive about merit-based success. This is a very big problem. So, now let me ask your thoughts on this. On what, why, what do you think uh, of this and what do you think uh, IITs in general should do about it? I think it is unfortunate that uh, every sad incident being linked to casteism, mm -hmm. which is of course not true. I see few consequences that all academicians would love to have a free flow environment. So, this kind of allegation will restrict them. I know for sure many colleagues, they are trying to be very restrained in their academic activities and this is not good. Second thing is that when students come to know about it, they there will be a division among them. And student, those who pass out from this place, they will go with a baggage. Somebody else will say that this or so and so person has come from IIT Madras. He must have imbibed this culture mm -hmm. and therefore not good. He's suspect. Suspect. He's a suspect without doing anything. Yeah. So it, it will trouble uh, in his or her uh, career graph. The, the, the student cannot, or the person who is becoming an employee in some organization, cannot contribute 100% because even if the student perform very well, the, the employee perform well, his ability to perform will be judged from different angle, not because that the person has put a lot of individual effort, is skillful or she is skillful, they produce better and let's appreciate, instead of being recognized, he will be suspected. We somehow uh, uh, imagined ourselves that we are a social spaces that we are doing wonderful technology, we are doing wonderful engineering, our work will speak for us and we will be automatically insulated from any such uh, problem. But actually the fact of the matter is that uh, all those things that we stand for, whether it is excellence, whether it is innovation, 
that can also be seen exactly or that can also be the foundation of our vulnerability. So, and naturally whenever such debates actually crop up and we become too defensive because in fact we don't have the ammunition actually to respond and as I said in the beginning, this is an asymmetrical warfare. We, we do certain things, we do our engineering and sciences really well, but we don't know how to respond to these situations. Maybe IIT also should now uh, acknowledge that there is this reality and this reality uh, survives on perception and uh, everybody knows that we are elite institutions, but not elitist institutions. We everybody knows that whoever has any fundamental understanding of recruitment, student admission, they all know that all norms are routinely followed whenever, as and when they evolve and they, these are not frozen things. I, I think Jyotirmay brought uh, a beautiful distinction between being elite and being elitist. Yes, yes. The yes. no. so elite is merit based and elitist is uh, privilege, uh, is uh, privilege based. based. That is the basic point you made that uh, um, all this sort of framework will be used against IIT graduates to stigmatize them forever and um, they will uh, be tempted not to give their best in their profession. I think that's a very, uh, you know, troubling situation because uh, I mean I, I have reasons to believe that some of that is already happening. So I want to thank all of you for a very uh, frank candid discussion we've had uh, and I'd like to continue coming back uh, to IIT Madras. I have been here 10 times of you and talks, launched many books, done many Swadeshi Indology conferences. I'm very grateful to all of you. So this is an important topic where I think I can contribute. In other words, I am the eyes and ears and I am very vocal, I am very courageous. I have no, I am not uh, concerned about what they will think of me. And, and I have taken on a, a very aggressive, uh, big uh, bully, Harvard as a bully, where they are hatching these kind of theories. And I have come up with this book. So I need support. I need your moral support. And other IITNs of any particular IIT and even technology people from anywhere, uh, in India who are in Silicon Valley or any place in the United States or Europe or wherever have an obligation because you are a product of a certain uh, you know university system and a certain background which gave you all the money you made all the success you should defend you should stick your neck out and defend and not be worried about oh you know I need to be non-controversial so what will happen to my next award and my next my next uh, you know uh, association and put me on this committee or that committee. I think that's very selfish. You have to now think beyond yourself, especially if you are doing well and, and you have to say, okay, I've done well. Now it's time for me to pay back and return something to these institutions and the culture that I came from. So that is what I will uh, leave you with. Thank you very much. And we'll continue the conversation in future. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.